see how it, oh, that'll be good. All right, give me nice big smiles. I'm gonna do a couple of these. And one more. I lied, now it's one more. I'm gonna make sure I can see everybody with their eyes open. It's perfect. Sorry, Good afternoon. We're going to take our seats and I want to welcome you to our annual Black Scholars Lecture Series. I'm Curtis Wright and I'm the Dean of Campus Life and the Chief Diversity Officer. And I'm so excited for you all to be here with us and for our amazing panel of, of scholars who are going to lead us on an amazing journey today. Um, we've got some special, com special activities that are going to be happening before we get to the panel. But before we do, I want to acknowledge and thank our president, Dr. Richard Grassi, for, for being here today. He's scheduled to be here with us today. <laughs> Dr. Grassi supported us against the steadfast from the very beginning. About eight years ago, Dr. Lloyd Weintraub, I don't know if Dr. Weintraub is in, in here, but Dr. Weintraub and a group of faculty got together with Dr. Pope, Dr. McNair and I, and they said, we really think that we should create a a forum, an opportunity for our students, our faculty, our campus to be introduced to scholarship um, and people who um, don't look like some of our faculty here. We want our students to understand that, that black folk, that there are black scholars that are creating and producing knowledge. Um, and so then we began our very first um, lecture with Dr. Trisha Rose out of Brown University. And every year since then, we've gotten progressive better. And this year, we've got two phenomenal people that are going to be, you'll be hearing from us. Wagner, and you're gonna hear a bit more about it in the program, has connected with the Port Richmond Partnership. Port Richmond Community and establishes fantastic partnership. And this year, our Black and Latino Male Initiative has also been working very closely with this fantastic school in Stapleton called the Eagle Academy. And their principal, principal Jermaine Cameron, is here with us today. So we're the work that those men are doing with those, with those young, with those young scholars at at, um, at at Eagle Academy is life changing, and I thank you for bringing our men in and allowing them to really have the soul changing work. Um, as you can see from our program, we've got some phenomenal people. Um, Dr. Steve Perry, who is this national phenom, who's opened four schools out in Connecticut, who's doing really, really great work. Um, but then we have our very own Dr. Nalia Lopez. Um, I first met Dr. Lopez on the commencement. Day as uh, in 2016, when she was being honored as one of our most decorated and really most um, dynamic graduates of the college. She came to us, graduated in 98 with a nursing degree. She and I have something in common. I was 12 when I graduated high school, college in 98, right? <laughs> and I'm sure you were 11 and a half, right? <laughs> but I graduated college. She graduated in 98 with a nursing degree, and I, and I remember her saying, I knew I wanted to change. I wanted to change the world. I wanted to, to do something good for people, but nursing wasn't going to be it. And I then went into education. And boy, has she changed that community in Brownsville. I used to live in East New York when I first moved to New York, so I know Brownsville and the work that she's done in that school. And, and Pedro Nagero came and he talked to us maybe seven years ago. And he, he didn't realize that you were an alum of Wagner, but he, he referenced, there's a woman in Brooklyn named Naya Lopez who's doing great things in this school. Uh, when we're saying, who are the models to look for? And you were that person that he told us to look for. Um, and so Nadia is going to, um, has done so many great things, but the really great thing she did was she was going to Skype in tonight. Um, and she changed her plans. She came from Granada, was it? To, Bro to Brooklyn, went to her house, got in the car, came over here. And when she leaves, she'll get on the, get in the taxi, go to the airport to go out to Salt Lake City where she's doing a conference tomorrow because she wanted to be a part of this conversation. She wanted to be a part of this At the top, you will see there's ties and scarves, our Black and Latino Women Initiative and our Women of Color Dog Circle. On Thursdays, wear ties and wear scarves. And earlier this evening, they gave both Dr. Perry and Dr. Lopez a Wagner College scarf and a Wagner College tie. So they will remember this experience when they go on to their travels, when they're talking to those great kids and those great scholars where they are um, changing lives. Right now, we have a special presentation from one of our esteemed um, government workers. She is the first African American to be elected to the city council from, from Staten Island. Um, and is really doing great work, and we're so honored to have her here. Councilwoman Debbie Rose. Thank you, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You can respond. 
So um, I want to first thank President Garassi and Dr. McNair for, oh, I thought you were signaling to me to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's not unusual. <laughs> People really don't want to hear you. Um, and Dr. McNair um, for uh, inviting me to this wonderful event. I want to, um, I want to say it's really great to be here at Wagner College uh, for your commemoration of Black History Month and, um, and the role of education in New York City. I want to thank you for the invitation to attend and to welcome you to my district, the 49th District of the City Council of New York. And as you know, or some of you might not know, before my election in 2009, Staten Island had never elected a person of color to any office. This position that I had to fight for, I ran three times before I won. And I didn't get into elected office by um, the fact that I was a part of a political um, institution, um, that my family was a political dynasty. Um, I had to work hard. I ran three times, and I had to chart my own course. As a member of the community board for 27 years and a member of the school board, much of my career was spent with working with at-risk youth and showing them the importance of education and how important it was to provide them with the resources so that they could be successful and achieve their goals in life and to prove to them that it doesn't matter what anybody else says about who you are and who you can be. It's what you believe you are and who you want to believe. And so as a member of the city council, we are involved in a lot of legislation around education. And um, as you know, we have a mayor who believes in early childhood education. And so pre-K has now become a common word. Everybody knows about pre-K. And now he's working on um, 3K because the belief in, and the science shows that early childhood education is beneficial and has an immediate effect on a person's ability to set the trajectory for success further on in their life. And so um, last month, I was appointed happily the chair of the youth committee and um, I'm excited that that gives me an entree into programming for young people in our schools so that they too can have the resources that it becomes a legislative discussion, it becomes a budgetary discussion, and it becomes an issue that we can move forward. So I'm really happy to be here among these paragons of education. Um, I'm excited. Uh, I was telling um, Dr. Uh, Nadia that um, we both went to Port Richmond High School. I graduated two years before she did. I'm only kidding, that's a joke. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm so impressed by her and Dr. Perry's um, accomplishments. And so, um, on behalf of the New York City Council, I would like to, and it's not a part of the program, but I have here for you certificates of recognition and acknowledgement for the work that you've done. You've done in communities of underrepresented youth, um, communities that traditionally have spent have low expectations, you have risen the bar, but not only have you elevated the bar, but you have showed other educators how the job should be done. So I'm really happy to be here. I am happy that, um, that your intellect and your skills are being s shared with um, this illustrious student body. Uh, uh, my job here is also to introduce um, the next speaker, who is a colleague of mine in government, and um, who also 
shares the same mission as I do to improve the quality of life for people who live here on Staten Island. And so I would like to introduce my colleague in government who has three decades of public service here on Staten Island, Deputy Borough President Ed Burke, who has a long-standing commitment to parks and recreation, cultural attractions, quality of life issues, and our city's youth. He is also a children's book author and I'm sure, as you will see soon, he's also an aspiring comedian. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to We're a tag team. <laughs> the most important part of my resume, Wagner College graduate, class of 80. Woo! And it's always great to come back. You know, I was, I was uh, sitting here listening to the councilwoman and saying, of all the great lessons I learned at Wagner College, uh, one that's been most important to me is to be good, do good, and see the good in other people. That was a big part of my Wagner experience and it's never left me. And certainly that's been continued by Dr. Garassi, one of the greatest gentlemen and scholars uh, that we've ever had here at this ca campus. And what he's done with the Wagner plan and so many other ways to have the college reach out to communities in need has just been an extraordinary. You have done heroic work. Thank you, Dr. Garassi. You know, I've never been hip in my life, ever. <laughs> never. But, you know, Staten Island is becoming hip, despite itself. You know, there's a lot of more multi multiculturalism, and there's a lot more um, festivals, and artistic community is coming forth, and suddenly there's a vibe on Staten Island, like, what's going on in Staten Island? And then the last week at, uh, alone at the St. George Theater, we had Steve Hackett from Genesis, Patti LaBelle, and Tape Face yeah. from America's Got Talent. Right. We're hip! <laughs> <laughs> But with all the excitement that's happening on Staten Island, uh, I think we all feel a real optimism uh, with the young people today in making a better future, don't we? I mean, yes. this, this is the generation that really sees it the way it should be. And, uh, and so as an alum, I'm proud that this forum is being held here at Wagner, it's being held on Staten Island, and the borough president would like me to make a presentation. Um, you may, have, may wonder why it's so sunny and bright in here when it's raining outside. Well, that's because it's Dr. Nadia Lopez Day in the borough of Staten Island. Okay. I'm going to read this quickly and then present it. Um, Whereas Dr. Nadia Lopez graduated from Wagner College with a BS in nursing in 1998 and was awarded an honorary degree in 2016 and is founding principal of Motwell Bridges Academy in New York City Public School, which has been praised for its positive learning environment, high expectations, and growing success rate in the middle of one of the most underserved communities in America. And whereas Wagner College has invited Dr. Lopez to discuss her contributions to the community and her path of providing leadership in underserved communities, showing how positive institutions can have a global impact. And whereas Staten Islanders commend Wagner College and Dr. Nadia Lopez for shining a light on this important matter and providing an opportunity to have a dialogue on this topic in honor of Black History Month. Now, therefore, James Otto, Borough President of Staten Island, does declare February 22nd, 2018, as Dr. Nadia Lopez Day in the Borough of Staten Island. Woo! Dr. Lopez met with some students and some faculty and staff in my office with tea and scones earlier. We were trying to be classy. And I felt like I was in Wakanda with the amount of black excellence that was right. in <laughs> This is just amazing. And speaking of scholars who happen to be black, we have one of the most dynamic senior academic officers that any other campus in the country has, and our provost, Dr. Lilith McNair. So Dr. McNair is going to serve as the Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. <laughs> She's going to be a model. So I turn to 
turn the panel and invite up our panelist and Dr. McNair to their seats, and we're going to begin this conversation. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Curtis. Thank you so much, Dean Wright. I will do my best to channel Ms. Oprah. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Lily McNair, and I serve as the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs for the college. This afternoon, I have the privilege and distinct honor of interviewing Dr. Steve Perry and Dr. Nadia Lopez, and moderating what I know will be a powerful conversation about empowering individuals to change communities. As you know, Wagner College has a storied history of impacting communities through meaningful coalition building, as evidenced by the Port Wishman Partnership, which our president started 10 years ago now, 10 years ago, as a vehicle for augmenting Wagner's highly successful Wagner plan for the practical liberal arts. Based on an agreement between Wagner College and leading organizations and institutions in Port Richmond, the partnership was designed to extend Wagner's commitment to learning by doing and to rejuvenate an economically distressed community. As you heard earlier, Dr. Lopez is a graduate of Port Richmond High School in the neighborhood. Sorry, excuse was confused. I graduated from a school in Harlem. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. Yes. Well, but it's okay. <laughs> oh, but thank you so much. Tell me your graduation, your, the high school you graduated from. A. Philip Randolph. A. Philip Randolph High School. Thank you for, thank you for demanding excellence of me. <laughs> Dr. Lopez is a graduate of A. Philip Randolph High School in Harlem. Um, however, she has worked in Port Richmond, probably through your work with the nursing, with the nursing yeah. program while you, were, while you were here. I want to say a little bit about the Port Richmond and the work that we've been doing because it closely underscores the excellent work that's being done by Dr. Perry and Dr. Lopez with regard to bridging the achievement gap. The rapid influx of different immigrant populations over the past two decades has really influenced the social and economic fabric of Port Richmond and has created complex needs in the areas of health care, education, arts and culture, housing, and employment. Since its inception, the number of partnerships organizations has grown to nearly 40, and through regularly scheduled meetings, partners have worked closely to tap into existing community assets by continuing to build significant, sustainable, and increasingly ambitious partnerships. To date, 40% of Wagner College undergraduate students, all many of you in this room, have at least one community experience in which, in which they work with and learn from the residents of Port Richmond. This partnership is anchored by the following five key pillars, which we have displayed here on the screen. <coughs> Immigration and advocacy, health and wellness, education and college readiness, economic development, and arts and culture. I want to say a little bit about a premier program that we have, again, that exemplifies the important work that we're talking about today. The Port Richmond Partnership Leadership Academy, or what we lovingly call PERPLA an academy that focuses on bringing students from Port Richmond High School who might otherwise not have the opportunity to go to college in the last two years of high school to come to campus in the summer, live on campus for a portion of time, take college credit classes, and do meaningful civic engagement work in the community. Of 27 students who have completed this program, 26 are fully enrolled in four-year college, and we are tremendously proud of the important work that these students have done. Like Dr. Lopez and Dr. Perry, we believe that the key 
to improving outcomes for our community is equipping its residents with the tools to achieve sustainable success. And today we're going to talk about how you've done it through your work. We've included their biographies in the program, and I'm sure you'll agree that we're in great company this afternoon. Both of you have defied expectations in your personal and professional lives and created these schools that serve as laboratories for other people to imagine what bridging the achievement gap for low-income black and brown kids might look like. Could you both begin by sharing with us a bit more about who you are what's caused you to want to use your talents to address the issue of equity in education. <coughs> oh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, that's the principal and me, but you're also here at Wagner, so we're gonna be excited about today, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, um, so a little bit about myself, I am, the proud product of immigrants to this country. My mother's from Guatemala, my father's from Honduras. Um, and so my only concept of what wealth was, was through education. There was nothing that my parents didn't do to show me the world through books, magazines. The black experience was through Eyes on the Prize. So I sat and watched Channel 13 a lot with my dad. Um, I was familiar with Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings, which will date me because many of you are not going to know who he is. Um, but my parents always made it possible for me to never see the limits in life, especially because of the amount of money we had. I would often travel back to Guatemala where poverty is much different from the poverty that you may see in communities like Port Richmond or where I, I work at in Brownsville. There, education is a priority. There, education is known to liberate. But those children there may only have one book, may only have one pair of shoes. But regardless of what, they show up for school. When I went into the school system, my parents, my mother with only a sixth grade education and my dad with a ninth grade education, entrusted that the teachers who would be in the schools would make sure that I received everything that I deserved. My mother couldn't advocate or tell me my math was wrong at night. She didn't even really read books to me well. She said by the time I was five years old and she tried reading the stories, because she's more fluent in Spanish, I took the book from her and said, I'll take it from here, mommy. <laughs> I got it, right? But she trusted that the teachers in every school that I went to was gonna provide me with a sound education. So of course she had to get an address a couple of blocks down the street to get me in the better school because she understood that by having me in the right school with the right adults would change the trajectory of my life and would have the greatest impact. Now you think about it in 2018, there are parents who are trying to still do the same thing. And it is unfair. And being in Brooklyn, one of the richest cities, part of New York City in the world, my children wake up every morning wishing that their lives were different, but they can't. The only thing I can do is provide them with an experience that shows them that every single day that they walk into Mount Hope Bridges Academy, that they are equal, if not better than everyone else. I make sure that they wear the colors of purple and black because I want them to know that they are descendants of royalty <coughs> and they are the ones who are destined for greatness, but it's through education. I fight every single day. So don't get it confused. Don't think because I call them scholars that we're on the right path and everything is great. I, unlike Dr. Perry, have a district public school. I'm not within a charter. I don't get any extra money. I have to fight a system that is clearly oppressive to children of color. I have to make sure that everything that my mother fought for me I'm doing on behalf of parents because every single time I have a PTA meeting, every single month, out of the 200 scholars that show up into my building, I only get six. I want you to hear that. I only get six parents out of 200 every month. So when you only have six parents who show up, the school system believes that they're not worthy of anything more. 
Why should we give her more money? And the fact of the matter is, is that I pour so much into social emotional learning because our children can't learn past hunger, past abuse, past disrespect. They can't do that. So the first year when I gave more money to social emotional learning, they took away $250,000. Because they said to me, I didn't prioritize academics first. But I told them, my kids are reading on a kindergarten to third grade level. They came to me like this before they even got here. You didn't take the money from the people before me. So I'm a disruptor and I'm proud of it. I am unapologetic. don't accept mediocrity because excellence only rises when you demand and expect it. So that's who I am. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez. Dr. Perry. First, I would like to uh, add my congratulations to Dr. Lopez and the entire Wagner family for the work that she's done and the work that you're doing in the community, so if you could give, give her a round of applause. I was born on my mother's 16th birthday into the third generation of poverty. The reason why I wanted to start a school is because I couldn't be convinced, convinced that black and Latino kids were dumb. I couldn't be convinced that just because you're born of a certain hue into a certain community that you're less capable of learning. I couldn't be convinced that just because you have to go to school by your zip code, that that was your fault. It doesn't take long to recognize once you really start to look at it, the fix is in. I say to my students in a very real way, I need you to understand that every single system that this, these United States has put in place is to keep you from being successful. You don't have to like that. I am not here to win an election. I'm here to make it clear to you. I want them to understand that just because every single element is, is stacked against them, it doesn't mean that those elements are going to win. We opened our first school within the Hartford public school system. Talk about, it's important that y'all really understand because you hear terms like public schools, you hear terms like, char I mean, terms like charter schools, you hear private and public, there are a lot of terms that are thrown at you. But in many cases, most people don't understand really what it is. What, when we started our first school in Hartford Public Schools, one of the things I recognize is that the teacher unions are determined to make sure that they make, that they make it so that they have control over all of the dollars that are going in and out of the public education system. That they get to determine how long the school day is or isn't, how long the school year is or isn't, who teaches what, when, and how. And there are implications of that. One of the reasons why now that I run a charter school, that I'm able to hire more African American males than other people is because I can move on teachers sooner than I could when I ran a traditional school. See, in the traditional schools, what I had to do is I had to wait until all the people who were to be placed, meaning that they had been bumped from one school to another, meaning that they lost their job for one reason or another, I had to make sure that they all had a job first, even if it meant that they were going to remove someone from our school who we had hired, as it was the case where my co-founder lost his job. Yes, my co-founder the person I started the school with lost his job because another school had failed to produce and so all the people in that school now needed to be placed in other schools which meant that they had to take people from our school and remove them. So when I tell you to fix this in, I really need you to understand what's going on here. There is such a thing as a school to prison pipeline and it starts in school. It starts in schools that are determined by where you live, which is a proxy for your income and your race. So when you really understand what's really going on, you start to think, so hold on a second. So if I'm fighting for this notion of a quote unquote public school, a school in which you go to school based upon where you live, then I'm also fighting to maintain a system that is consistently and persistently undermined the very existence of African Americans and Latinos and poor white people seeking the opportunity to push themselves forward. So what it is I do is I understand that I have an obligation to educate people about really what public and private really means. A charter school is a public school. What makes it public is that we have the same expectations, but then we have additional expectations. We receive money from the public 
and it's less money than the traditional schools. So our school in Connecticut receives $11,000 per pupil. It's a charter school. It's in Bridgeport. In Bridgeport, the traditional schools receive $16,000 per pupil. They got a $130, $130 million building and a $20 million athletic complex. We have a former mental health facility. So what happens is, in situations such as these, people don't really understand what's what, so they hear charter school, they hear public school, and they think privatization, they think, oh my God, they're trying to take things away from us. Yeah, I want to take something away. I do. I want to take away the likelihood of a kid who's just born, all they did was get born into a neighborhood. And think about it, as Dr. Lopez said, why should a child have to steal an education? Why should a child have to be reminded that, no, 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 babe, you live at your grandmother's house. You don't, no, no, mama, I live here. No, 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 you don't. No, you do not. You live down the street. You live, no, I do not. I need you to understand that you have to wake up. We have to wake up that there's something going on and it's destroying our community. Kids are waking up and their lives are being determined by something as silly as a zip code in these here United States. Let me make this final point. We have a school in Bridgeport. We have a school in Harlem. 96% of the children that we accepted into the sixth grade could not read, write, or do math on grade level. 96%. 99% of the kids that we accepted into our, our school in Harlem in the sixth grade cannot read on grade level. 99%. No one lost their job because of that. All those grown people are still employed. And so when I start running my mouth, all I'm hearing is a little ice cube. I'm the one they love to hate, y'all can. <laughs> I recognize what they don't want me to say to you. They don't want me to point out that that school in Bridgeport that I just told you about took those kids in who were 96% of whom couldn't read on grade level and in one calendar year became the top performing school in the state in one year. Because if we can do it, then no one can say it can't be done anymore. And once that truth becomes self-evident, then this system that is maintained every single day by lies of adults who want to keep their jobs and live their lives in the suburbs while working in the hood will be disrupted. So my hope is that you leave here uncomfortable, really uncomfortable, because there's nothing more hurtful than looking down at one of our children and recognizing that all they did wrong would be born in the wrong neighborhood. Thank you very much. Each of you have shared very clearly how your experiences growing up and your review of what's important to you as you look throughout your communities really sets you on this passion of changing the way our educational system works. Thank you so much for that. Now we're gonna delve deeper into some other issues. Dr. Perry, according to a study by the Washington DC based Council of Great City Schools, only 4% of college students in the United States are black men. You've written books, hosted television shows, and given countless talks on the topic of black male achievement. From your research, why do you think black men are underrepresented in higher education? I, I'm pretty sure on this one. <laughs> African Americans make up 18% uh, of the uh, kindergartners, yet 49% of the kindergartners who are, are suspended out of school. I want you to hear what I just said. 18%, 49% of the ones who are suspended out of school at five years old. Kindergartners are still five, y'all. 
When I said the system is rigged, I need you to understand. People say, well, the schools are broken. No, they are not broken. That is exactly what they were designed to do. Make sure that the ones who are believed to be the most dangerous to the community are neutralized upon entry. Neutralized upon entry. Think about it really simply. How much could you possibly learn when you ain't in the classroom? I don't care how bright you are. And then, again, I need you to think of the parallels because this is a nation that has a very deep and ugly history. Not every part of this thing is bad, but there's some things that are pretty bad that we've got to have an honest conversation about. African American men or African men brought over here in chains were the most dangerous ones who had to be neutralized upon entry. Upon entry. And so, it doesn't take really long. It's not that deep. After that time, you see what happens. Within the schools, the majority of the people who are working within schools are not males or African or African American or Latino, they are white. And mainly female. Does that make them bad people? Not in the least, that's an absurd notion. But it does make it true. <laughs> and in that truth, we have to look at what is. We have to recognize that within this system that has been designed largely by white men, that African-American men are not going to win when that system is the one that is persisting today. So when you have people like me and others who say, hey, hey, well, you know what? How about this? Can I just educate mine? Can I take public money because I am part of the public and use public money to educate the public's children who happen to be African-American Latino? No, 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 you can't do that. You got to send them back to these traditional schools. Well, why, though? The reason is because it maintains a structure within which we are more interested in spending three times as much money to send an African to prison than we are to Princeton. And so it does, it, you know, I, I don't want to be the one to break it to y'all, but that really is not Santa Claus. <laughs> ain't no Easter Bunny coming. There's some things that it's not true. This is not a country in which every single body is given the same opportunity to be successful. And, and all of you who say that you believe in diversity, right? You don't believe in diversity until you are prepared to give up your seat. Mm -hmm. let, me, let, me, let me really make sure, because don't clap like you like me, because I drove here, I don't really care. You don't have to like me, but I just need you to really understand. Because I'm going to say, tell you what it is. If you believe for a moment that there is such a thing as an unearned disadvantage, then you have to accept that there's an unearned advantage. And some of y'all might have gotten it. <laughs> and so if you believe that to be so, then you have to accept that these same unearned disadvantages are being passed on to generations that are coming behind you. And so until such time as all children are given access to a quality education, regardless of where they live, think of how draconian and bizarre in the United States of America that you have to lie about your address or win a lottery or be able to buy your way out of slavery in 2018. So it's a really clear process. The reason why it is so is because it was designed to be so. And until such time as these young people get off the hashtags and start doing something, we're going to keep with the same system. Mm. Thank you very much. And for opening up the dialogue about the myth of meritocracy. It truly is a myth. And it is a perfect segue to my next question for you, Dr. Lopez. In the audience we have with us, Principal Jermaine Cameron from the Eagle Academy, Staten Island's campus. Eagle Academy was created in part in response to research from the New York State Corrections Department which indicated that over 85% of the men in New York State prisons originate from seven zip codes in the New York City area. Here we go, about where one lives. Groundsville, where Mont Hall Bridges Academy is located, is one of those neighborhoods. In a TED Talk, you pondered the question, why open a school? And your response was to close a prison. Can you please talk? Can you 
Can you please talk about the cradle to prison pipeline and how the work that you, Principal Cameron, and Dr. Perry engage in might interrupt this process? It costs $80 billion a year to keep people incarcerated. $80 billion a year. That's crazy. Right, it's crazy. So when I tell you that I'm almost lost a million dollars in the eight years that I've had a school open to make sure that my children don't get to prison. It's a setup. 80% of New York State prisoners come from communities like Brownsville, East New York, um, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Far Rockaway, the South Bronx, and some parts of Staten Island. 80%. And they're in there for low-level offenses. Nothing major. But unfortunately, what ends up happening in our communities is that when you ask Dr. Perry the question about um, the research, the question that I have to you is, what is the image that you see of black men in our community that are successful? What's the first type of career that they have, that they're successful? Absolutely. Athlete. What's the second one? Rappers. Rappers. So our kids never see images of those people who are in higher institutions. Because when we make it, we're not going back. And that's the unfortunate part about it. So for me, when I opened up Mount Hope Bridges Academy, what was important to me is that I don't want my kids to only think about I'm going to be an athlete. It burned my soul when I asked a sixth grader, what do you want to do? I'm going to be a football player. I'm going to be a basketball player. I need that to be your plan B. What's your plan A? When you leave here, that's going to be your plan B. I need you to have a plan A. My kids now say, I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be a web designer. Right? I'm going to be a writer. And the only way I was able to make that possible is because I bring those very images into the school. I bring those people into the school. I partner with organizations so my scholars understand that who you are is not defined by what other people have said about you. You need to understand who you can become. The problem that happens in Brownsville, the problem that happens in Port Richmond is that there are not enough successful people that they believe come out of their communities. So they don't want to aspire to be more. I still live in the hood. I still live in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. I make it every single day to Brownsville. I tell my kids every single day, my success is because of you. When I go around the world, I'm talking about you and how dope you are. <laughs> so just imagine if you believe that for yourself, where you'll, you'll end up. The problem that is not dealt with, and we don't have the real conversations, is about who's in our classrooms and who's leading our schools. Bottom line, because leadership matters. Yes. <clears throat> leaders set the tone. Leaders set the expectations. Leaders are the ones who accept mediocrity in the classroom. So when I came to Wagner, unfortunately, Dr. Jurassic wasn't mine. He wasn't the provost then. He was vice provost. When I hear about all the great things that have happened, all the changes that have happened, that's based off of a vision, and that's based off of leadership, that's based off of a team, that's a non-negotiable. In order for you to be here, in order for you to say that you are a Seahawk, you are going to leave here flying knowing your purpose. And if you still don't know it, Please understand that you will find it, but you would have learned something along the way. Every single day, that's what I'm fighting for for my kids, to know that they are relevant, to know that they are not invisible. When I look at how many of my kids come in unable to read on a sixth grade level, one of my former teachers, Renee Kinsell, who's here, who's now working at the Eagle Academy School, right? She had to deal with that. Children who cannot create a sentence, children who cannot write a paragraph. And the question that you ask yourself is, 
How is this possible? And like Dr. Perry said, a lot of people don't lose their jobs. But they will come to me as the principal and say, how have you failed these children? What happened between kindergarten and fifth grade? So I did open a school to close a prison. I refused to keep my mouth shut. I refused to allow the very system that writes me a check to think that I'm obligated to protect them, because I'm not. God didn't call me into that space to accept just anything. My mother always said, you were called to work harder than most. And it is unfortunate that in this day and age, we have to still fight. It is a civil right fight that's happening every single day in our schools. And when our children don't get to see images outside of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and I'm gonna be real honest, I had a conversation with my sixth graders just last week. Who's Martin Luther King? No, no. I'm a I want you to listen to this. He helped free the slaves. <laughs> they are in sixth grade. Why don't they know who Martin Luther King, at minimum, who he is? Because their families don't know. And their families went to the same schools in the community. So it's generational. So for me, when we fail to give our children the right education, quality education, it becomes generational genocide. Mm -hmm. And we are killing the next generation of prominent children who can be anything that they want, all through a book and a pen. Thank you very much. Dr. Perry, would you like to respond after that? I, you know, uh, really quickly, um, because there's so much to cover, if we're going to be honest, right, in this room. That's what we're gonna do for a little while. Suspend lies just for a little while. Um, so put your Facebook picture away because you really don't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not really your life, like everybody tells you. Know, so, so, a second. If we're gonna be honest, especially those of us of color who've come from, and or who are white, who've come from school systems that have not been successful, you probably had experience very similar to mine. 30 years ago when you got to campus and by Thursday you were like, oh snap, I used everything I learned. Mm -hmm. And you recognize that you don't know what everybody else knows. And writing is a lot harder than it has ever been because where you came from, you didn't have to write 20 page papers in your life. You didn't read 20 pages and, and, and internalize it as if you're dumb. And, and, and I struggle with this. I only make a little bit of light of it because if I don't, I will cry in front of you. Because that's a messed up feeling to be the best in your community. And you know. And you're the one who made it to WAP. You're here on campus. And you hear kids saying words and you think, wow, that's English? I didn't even know that word existed. You hear professors saying words and it does not sound like the language that you grew up with. It's unconscionable to believe that you could live in these here United States, have access to the same media, have access to so many other, but your schools were so well designed to make sure that you underperformed that despite all your best efforts, all your best efforts. You, you made it to college, like let's call it what it is. And you thought every single time you sat in classrooms such as this, lecture halls such as this, I am just dumb. And then here's the worst part, you call home to talk to somebody about this and they don't really understand what's going on because in their mind they're like, are you really serious right now? You calling me complaining about college? Do you want my life? So nobody where you're from is where you're at. Nobody where you're at is where you're from and all you feel is alone. You feel like you are on an island. That is still happening. There are children right behind you right now 
And what's so horrible about it is they're going to experience the same damn thing. They're going to come here and be sitting in the same seats that you're sitting in, make it to the same dormitories that you make it to. And they're going to think, I am dumb. I'm dumb. And they're going to have that experience like you had when you get back that first paper. You're like, wow, did she just color this with a red pen? Did she even look at it? Like, it just looks like she just scribbled on. Like, I don't even know what she's saying at this point. Like, I'm just feeling some kind of way. Like, I feel offended like we should fight this woman. Like, for real. <laughs> if she questions me one more time, I'm going to lose all this up in here behind me. I'm telling you. This is still happening because it happened to me. It happened to those people who came before me, and it's happening to the same people who come behind you. The reason why we do what we do is we got to stop it. You've heard the story about the, the babies in the water, right? You've heard about the babies, and you see the babies, somebody, all these people standing by the river, and all these babies are coming down the stream, and somebody just takes off and runs, and they say, well, what are you doing? Because everybody's pulling the babies out of the water. They say, I want to get up there and find out who's putting the babies in the water. We're the top. We're the top. This is crushing for me. To have to have the same conversation over and over all over the country is old to me. Sure, I get paid to do it, but I don't like it. I would rather talk about something else. I have other things on my mind. I do. I just bought a jet ski. I don't know how to use that damn thing. But I saw some white people in my neighborhood with jet skis, so I'm like, I'm going to get a jet ski too. I want to talk about other things. I got things I'm interested in. But I keep talking about this foolishness because I can't get enough people to understand that this is not cool. You want to know why people tear up neighborhoods and shoot people and make all y'all scared to go to their neighborhoods? It's because of this right here. Because they're looking up and they know that they're living in a social coma. They are very much awake. They know what's going on around them, but they didn't do this to themselves, and they can't get up out of this coma, and they come to school, they know they can't read. The first children's books that I saw were when I was reading them to my sons with a doctorate in education. Nobody read to me, man. My father was in prison by the time I was 18. Nobody was reading to me. Everybody was telling me, you better know how to fight. And it would be all right if I was the last person to deal with that. But right now, somebody is at home thinking they're a good dad because they're teaching their son how to fight. Mm -hmm. Folks, y'all got to wake up. I mean it. It's bad out here. It really is. It sucked to be you to try and have to go through and give up on math because you just figure, I'm just not good at math. Despite the fact that you came here with the expectation that you were going to go to med school. Give up on science because you just figured, I'm just not good at science. Because no one taught you. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with all these kids who came behind you. There is something wrong with this system. It's wrong, man. It's really wrong. Even when the system goes up against itself, when it goes up to the judicial branch and is brought up before every judicial branch every single time, it's proven time and time again that sending kids to school only based upon where they live is inherently unconstitutional every single time from 1954 forward. But because teachers unions, buys a couple ads, takes out a, a gang of money, and runs people, runs it against people like me, who want to tell you the truth, want to tell you to wake up. We keep it going. I'll finish here. Last week, I was at the State Board of Education. I just told you one of the highest performing schools in the entire state of Connecticut in just one year, just one year. 100% minority. 100% minority. 100%. 80% poor. We went up to the state 
and said to them, you know what? Y'all was supposed to give us 41 seats. 40, 41, I said just 41 seats. There are half a million kids in, in Connecticut. We just want 41. This is 41. It's 41. Ain't that many. The State Board of Education said, we would rather give the money away than to allow you to expand. So they gave away a half a million dollars last Wednesday for Valentine's Day. 41 kids cannot come to our school and have been sent back to a school in which 96% of them will not learn to read, write, or do math on grade level. If y'all don't think this is real, if you think that this is we just playing up here, like this is just like you just watching two performers, you done lost your minds. It's bad. It's really bad. It's really bad. And honestly, it's going to get worse. Thank you for those sobering responses. Now, was it planned this way? But my next question is, <laughs> not to get too political, but I'd like to hear from both of you on what impact, if any, you believe the Trump administration's policies might have on the work that you do in educating our children and diminishing this achievement gap. So, you want to start? Is there a policy? Right. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what the policy is. So if anybody in the audience knows, um, please enlighten me. Um, so I'm still waiting. Right? I think that we were all, well for me personally, um, the choice of who we have in terms of Secretary of Education was concerning. I had my scholars watch videos of her before Congress, mm -hmm. unable to answer questions, and they said to me, is this supposed to be the person <laughs> running <laughs> education? Does she know? Anything, these are seventh and eighth graders asking this question. Education is not a priority, folks. Not in the state of address to, uh, to the union. There's no conversation about education. Because if we talked about what's wrong, if we really focused on the policies that's failing our children, that would get people angry and want to demand change. But our current president is okay with us not talking about change. The things that he's talking around it though is impacting all of us who are in education. So immigration is an issue. I have children who are afraid that ICE is gonna come to their house looking for their parents, right? So in a lot of our states, there has been a decline in student enrollment because children are afraid that if they leave to go to school, they either will be taken at school because schools are a government institution, or when they get home, their parent won't be there. <clears throat> we have this controversy now about guns. For him to turn around today and say, teachers should now have guns, I mean, I have some teachers who will go postal in a second. <laughs> I'm not being funny. But I provide mental health support services for a lot of my teachers because children who are from our community have a lot that they bring and teachers are adults who have their own issues. And so now you have a gun? <laughs> you know, I might be liable to tick somebody off every day. So the reality is that it's not important enough. And when we're not talking about education in the public, there are deals being made behind the scenes. Deals that a year from now, we'll hear about it, but we won't ever be able to argue about it. And it's very unfortunate. So like, let's say for instance, our New York State, um, the, the changes that we made in the evaluation system, that is a lot of work for, it's just, it's a lot. Do you know they passed that law at 1.43 in the morning? I know because I was up. After they were debating about a casino. 
So all of the elected officials left because they had been grandstanding so long about the casinos that the people who would have voted maybe against it or at least have a voice left. So at 1.43 in the morning, they passed this law that now everyone in the New York City Department of Education, we now have to subscribe to this evaluation system that is overbearing, and guess what it's not doing? It's really not changing our system. It's not changing the quality of education. It's more paperwork that I have to do every single day. It's holding me more accountable, but not the system above me. So all they do is watch me on a system. How many times I go on the system to update something? You know that feeling, right? <laughs> And then when you say, I, I could have told you that the teacher is developing in one observation, two observations. I don't need six. Now I have to put a plan in place online and then show how I'm moving that teacher over time. As opposed to, this teacher is not effective, I need them to just leave today. That's what Dr. Perry's talking about when it comes to unions. Now the type of school that I have, I'm gonna make you feel uncomfortable every single day with or without your union. Because the way I have a relationship with the union is, we're gonna go into this class together. Because I need you to explain to these children why we're allowing this teacher to stay in this building and why you're allowing yourself to represent them. Just, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> So the Trump administration, it's not here to engage in these conversations. It's here to engage in the wealthier getting wealthier, and the poor remaining poor, and making sure our school to prison pipeline is in effect. And if you think about it, those who are detained through immigration because they have no constitutional rights are now being placed in detention centers for up to five years. So that's the new prison pipeline. So there is money being generated all around us. And as long as we're not woke to the information, as long as we're not asking questions, as long as we're paying attention to social media and all the hashtags, I'm going to say this. Movements mean nothing if we're not in action. I'm going to say it again, because a lot of people like to show up for marches. And I get criticized a lot because people say, I don't see you at the march. And my thing is, what's your ask? I'm not marching without an ask. Because those who died before us who marched had an ask. And they demanded something. We're not asking for anything. We're asking for more likes. We're asking for our hashtag to go viral. We're asking to be part of videos. And then those same people who are part of the movement move on after they've made a lot of money. And guess what happened? None of them ever come back to a school to talk to the children about what they need to do, become advocates in their communities, to become change agents, and to understand how the policies that are not in effect or are in effect continue to oppress them. Dr. Lopez, Dr. Perry. So here's my answer. One of the problems is that we get caught up in parties. We get caught up in whether we're Democrats or Republicans. But we don't often look at the politics. I can join and, and feel comfortable joining the, the chorus of people who say hey, Donald Trump is a clown. Like I can say that and I feel that way and I really mean it. But the Democrats have done us no better. Travel, if you will, to your favorite hood. <laughs> Run by Democrats. And I'm going to keep it going. Travel, if you will, to your favorite hood. Run by black Democrats. Latino and Latina Democrats. The same people who say that they care about our community, ask them where they send their black and Latino children to school. It's always interesting to hear people, I'm so pro-public school, when they talk about that, right? These politicians, I'm pro-public school. Yeah, homie, how come your kid goes to Our Lady of this or that? <laughs> you Roman Catholic now? <laughs> Word? <laughs> See, I want to go 
go deeper than that. I'm with team get it done. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, a white person or a black person. I just want to win. That's my thing. So I got to find a way to get it done. So sure, it's easy for me. I mean, come on, I can sit here and talk. I mean, who can't, Donald Trump? I mean, what more could this guy do? I mean, for real, like, he's bananas. <laughs> but much as I love Barack and Michelle, this brother never sent his kid to a public school. Never as in never. People are like, why do you say that? Because it's true. And I'm not mad at that. You hear what I'm saying? I think he should have a choice, but I think everybody should have a choice. Well, he's president. He wasn't born president. Back in Chicago, his kids were going to private school, which I'm cool with. Hear me. I'm cool with that. But I want the same options for every kid, whether it be public, private, charter, magnet, home, vocational, technical, or yet to be determined. Children come in all shapes and sizes. I have a very good friend. She went to Harvard and Brown. Her son is autistic. He's been to at least five different schools so far, and counting, and counting. She can't move every time she wants to send him to a new school. That's not how this thing goes down. And not everybody who's doing all right is doing that all right. There are local private schools that are anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand dollars, and we're talking about just elementary school. People can't do it. You can't do it. You can't. So we have to have public options. There have to be many public options. And unfortunately, Democrats in particular, black and Latino legislators in particular, are standing up and saying, no, 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 no. Because too few of them have the infrastructure in their own campaigns to be able to run their own campaigns. So they depend heavily on the teachers unions to bolster their campaigns. And they're the ones in many cases for many of our black Democrats. I'm just saying it the way it is. Yes, talk about it. I'm just saying it the way it is. These are the people who are printing up their brochures. These are the ones who are creating the people, I mean, creating their, 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 their websites. These are the ones who are out in the community knocking on doors. They're coming from this organization. They are to the black Democrats what the NRA is to the white Republicans. These, in many cases, are the backbone of their support because they get guaranteed dough from every single public school teacher. Every single time she gets a check, She's got to cut them a, a, a piece of it. That's every single time. And so you're talking about a $2.2 billion a year institution. This is real money, y'all. And so it's hard for them, in some cases, to be a person who didn't come up with a political family, who didn't come up with a political chops, and says, I want to run for local office. And they want to run for local office, and who are they going to go to? Well, they go to the same people everybody's been going to. Because here's the rest of it. We as black and Latino people, we ain't giving no damn money. <laughs> We're not supporting them like they need to be supported. We're not making sure they can run just independently. So they're stuck. They're stuck with the only institution that's going to show up and knock on doors on their behalf. And this is the paradox that we find ourselves in. This is me talking to you like the grown people that you are. This is saying this is what it is. So when I say the fix is in, it becomes real simple. What happens is an African-American or Latino wants to run for office. She, he, they says, well, I can't run as a, as a, I mean, as a Republican because that would be dumb. Everybody would call me a sellout if I ran as a Republican. So if I do that, then I ain't going to win in the hood. So I can't do that. Now I got to run as a Democrat. If I run as a Democrat, I got to take this union money. I take this union money here to union politics. Keep this school open so that everyone in here who has a job gives me a cut. You don't do that, I ain't giving you my money. Well, if I keep all the kids in there, then they're not gonna get an education because we done said it how many times, seven districts in here send 75% of people to prison. So, but I don't really feel comfortable with that. Well then run on your own, chief. Run on your own. Print your own brochures. Get your own people out there to knock on doors. Do those things yourselves. Oh man, my cousin them ain't gonna do all that. <laughs> they want me to win, but they ain't really trying to get me to win like that. They'll hit me with a hashtag, but it's gonna be a lot to get them to come out there five days a week, six days a week, seven days a week. Because when you run for office, you gotta run every day, all day. When you in the grocery store, you're still running for office. 
So you really need to understand the politics behind the politics because when you understand the politics behind the politics, you start to understand why certain policies persist over time. These institutions whose very existence are driven by them being able to take money from a system that employs people, calling it the public, and then gives that money back to, to, up, to bolster up a private organization makes it possible for us to continue to be in schools. But when you get to Wagner, you're like, damn, I don't really read on the same level as these other people. And I'm at to work three times as hard to be successful. And so you miracles, because you're all miracles in so many ways, you don't even know. I say that with all due respect to you. If you really understood the students here, just how much of a miracle you are, how much of a miracle you were to get to this school, how much that, because that's, it ain't nothing but God. Like, I don't know what you believe in, but that right there ain't regular. Yeah, that's right. It's not about a party for me. I want to see... Do you support school choice, the same school choice that you exercise as a parent? Do you, su you support the same exact school choice for every single living child? If you don't, we ain't cool. We're not going to work together. I'm going to work against you, and I'm going to win. <laughs> yeah. We've covered a lot of topics, as both of you have talked in a very inspired way about your commitment to bridging the achievement gaps. And in your writings, you talk about your students and how their voices inspire you to lift up yours. Who, who of your students have helped you form your voices? And what are the most important lessons that you think future educators could learn from your students? Um, I think The gift of being an educator is, is like God's blessing. I've been inspired just about by every single child that has either been at my hall or beyond my hall. Um, we tend to make assumptions about children, whether they're in poverty, thinking that they don't have morals, they don't want to aspire to more. And then on the flip side, you think of someone who's wealthy, they have it all, they don't have issues. And the reality is that children do come with a lot. I've worked in more affluent neighborhoods where parents are never home. They make a lot of money, but they're never home. Child is suicidal, child is using drugs. Parents are not aware. Flip side, I'll be in Brownsville, and my kids aren't using drugs. They're just stressed out and they're angry and they just need someone to listen and talk to them. So I lead by my heart first and by God's purpose. And every single day before I get to school, I pray that he just allows me to do his work. And every day that I'm in the school, I pray again, thanking him for allowing me to be in that space because I don't know if I will never see one of my scholars again. And that's hard to think about because anytime I'm in my building, there's helicopters that pass by all day, every day, sirens that pass by. And it's, it's amazing how desensitized children are to those sounds. It's amazing how they still work through it. My office is on the other side, like I'm down the block, literally my office is down the block in my building, that's how long the hallway is. And when I go to the corner, that's the other block, where all the traffic has to stop, I hear more of the noise pollution, and my kids have to go through that. So I look at them as the most resilient, beautiful, amazing, phenomenal children ever. Because they have to make it through a war zone every single day. There are more than 32 gangs in Brownsville. I need you to understand, there's more than 32 gangs. My kids get recruited at the, at the grade level of fourth grade. My kids don't go to the library because the libraries are embedded within the housing developments, which are the projects. So they can't cross certain streets. So Brownsville Houses is right across the street from Van Dyke Houses, and Van Dyke is where the library is. My boys can't go across the street. 
because they're liable to be killed because that's another game. My kids can't go to certain schools. So if I want my child, one of my scholars, and I say my child because they are my kids, and he needs to get on an L train, but because he has beef with somebody in Cephalo, and the L train is by Cephalo, he can be killed. Now I gotta rethink, what high school can he go to? That's every single year. It is life or death every single day. So I'm inspired just by them showing up. I'm inspired by even them having an attitude. Because that means that they still have feelings within them. And they care enough about something because they're angry about something because someone didn't care enough to pay attention. And so when every, anytime someone asks me, what inspires you the most? It's really my kids. Because there's a lot of people who don't show up for them. There are a lot of adults who don't show up. And so for those of you, whether you go into education or not, because when I left Wagner, I was a nursing major, and I just knew I was going to be Florence Nightingale until I was like, that's not going to be my life. I went to work for the phone company. I was the person that you had to call when the phone was going to be cut off, or it was cut off. And people were angry at me. And I thought about, I went to Wagner. I graduated with a BSN. Why am I on this phone with this person who's mad at me because they couldn't pay their bill? <laughs> but guess what? I was being prepared for those children who were going to be angry and their parents and understanding they're not mad at me. They're mad at their circumstances. So I can either be in a position of helping you or I can be in a position of hurting you by saying, I'm not here to help you right now. I've learned through that process. And you have really demonstrated and you wrote about it in your book being able to see through a young child's anger mm -hmm. to really see where he was coming from and help him to really achieve his best. Yes. You know what, he wasn't angry at you or other people. He was angry because he had a hard time keeping up in school. Yeah. And you helped him do that. That's great. Who helped you form your voice? Well, I, you know, first, I, I think it's important to, to distinguish. We talk about the achievement gap as if it's a, um, a fixed object. Really, the achievement gap is a belief gap. It's driven by that. That's the source of the achievement gap. If you take an iPhone to the poorest neighborhood in America, and you take an iPhone to the wealthiest neighborhood in America, I submit to you that you will not find an achievement gap. <laughs> Despite the fact you are looking at the highest technology available to humans by retail. So it's not about what a child can learn, it's what they're taught. If I teach you 10% of the information and you retain 100%, you still fail. If I teach you 50% and you retain 100%, you still fail. 60%, you still fail. If I don't provide you with access to the information because of one or two reasons, I believe you can't learn it or believe you won't learn it, then I won't do it. The reason I called you miracles early is because I know that a lot of y'all depend upon the school system you came from. And even if you came from a suburban school system, if you're African-American, Latino, you still came from the school system in which in many cases it's not believed that you, even though you live there, are of the same type as the other kids who are there, there's a belief gap. The belief gap shows itself in tracking some kids are in AP classes, other kids are not. In many cases, you walk through the building and you can tell which ones are AP classes and which ones are not just by the color of the kids in the class. That's a manifestation of a belief gap. It's a manifestation of a belief gap. And that belief gap becomes entrenched and it becomes almost policy. And you ask, how did some kids get into AP classes and other kids didn't? They'll tell you things like certain kids took a test and that's actually not true. They were placed there. Someone made a decision to put certain kids in certain classes and other kids in. It's just a decision that's driven by a belief gap. A belief gap. It's nothing else. It's really one person saying that I don't believe that you would do the work if I gave it to you. 
I don't believe that you will pass the test if I put you in the class. I don't believe, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. And I need you to hear me when I say this, that's not a belief gap that's driven by some angry white person. There are black people who make that same damn decision, who are in the same positions of power who don't believe that a person who looks like they look, who comes from the same neighborhood that comes from, and in fact, they may have gone to high school with that person's mother, but for whatever reason, there's a belief gap there. So I stay inspired, I stay up, because I can't believe I get to do this for a living. I, I'm, and I, I'm saying that, I know different people have different majors, and some of y'all are here because you want the extra credit, and awesome, just sign a paper and that'll happen too, but, I don't know what the rest of you want to do for a living, but there ain't nothing cooler than what I get to do. I promise you, I don't care what you do. I've had the opportunity to meet some pretty well off people who do some pretty cool things, and not one time have I ever been in a conversation with any of these people and thought, hey, you know, I really wish I, nah, I, I, what you do just sounds kind of boring. <laughs> like it just does, and I, it's a, I, don't, I know you feel the same way sometimes. I don't want to be disrespectful to people. I'm like, wow, okay. Uh, uh. That sounds like so much fun. Wow. That's so cool. You get to do that. That's awesome. And I just play, like, I don't even understand it. What you do is so complicated. Wow. I get to go to football games on Friday nights. And I get through it on my kids. People say, What's your favorite capital prep? Like, no, like, what's your favorite professor? I don't know those fools. I got them. They're not. I'm not going to look like a grown man wearing the jersey of a team that have no affiliation with ain't paying me. You're going to pay to put money on my body. <laughs> if it's on my body, you going to, yeah, you, yeah, I'm, that's not going to happen. Uh, I, I wear Detroit Pistons jersey because one of my kids is a Detroit Pistons. But other than that, I'm not doing it. I stay inspired because I get to work with kids every single day. I don't understand, and, and, and I really mean this, I don't understand how someone could see our kids and not be just like, swole, like, do you, I don't understand how you see them and you just don't want to do something. Like, how do you see a kid and you know his story? Like, you know his story. And you don't know his story like you feel sad, like pitiful for him because you can't be both pitiful and powerful at the same time. You can't, you can't do that, right? So I don't feel pity for my kids. I, you know, I was talking to one of the mothers today and she's like, well, I gotta go back to Jamaica for five days. You gotta go for five, four days. That's gonna get you jammed up, sis. Well, you know, we Jamaicans, ah, y'all ain't the only ones who got traditions. I'm gonna tell you right now, you don't need to find another flight. And why don't you do it? And that, I don't feel sorry for the sister because I know her circumstances. I know that she's gotta, she gotta make a different decision. She gotta make a different decision. She can't make that decision. That day, we can't do that. Cause then you'll come back to me and ask me why your child failed. Cause you made that silly ass decision. You should not have done that. I told you. And then when I gotta call ACS on you because they gonna call chronic absenteeism, then you are gonna be mad at me. So I'm telling you today, don't make that decision. I don't feel pity, you understand? Cause I see the power. I see the power, I don't feel bad for you. I, I see your providence and as such, I'm inspired because I know that you can make a different decision and you call out there and say, do y'all need me for all five days? Like, I can't FaceTime into none of this. Like, if, if I was just a responsibility, if we put together a family union, I can't, like, we can't do this electronically. My daughter, so you mean my daughter's gonna fail a class? Because, nah, uh-uh. No, mm -mm, not doing it. So I'm inspired all day because that's what my real job is. Like in my real job, there are people who are speakers and they just go out and speak. Like, I, I really do work with kids like that. I was co-teaching with a teacher today. He's not very good, that's all right. <laughs> not very good at all. But okay, it's not all right, but I'm being polite right now. So the, the point is that I stay up because I see what's in front of me. I don't understand how someone can meet our kids knowing that they're gonna be you one day. Like, right? Like, knowing that they're going to be you or you or you. Like, that's, this is what they're going to be. And you not just be jacked. Like, watch and see what I do today at work. Like, seriously, like, watch and see what I do today. Watch and see. I, I don't understand it. So, for me, it's, it's almost a foreign question when someone says, how do you stay inspired? How do you not? How do you not? That's a great answer. Right? I see people in the audience smiling and nodding their heads, and I think that you are, you're, um, 
inspiration is contagious and your commitment. Now it's time to open up the floor to the audience now. If you have a question, please raise your hand and someone with a microphone will come to you. State your name and in the spirit of Twitter, give us a 120 character or less question. <laughs> so who's the brave soul who's going to start Before we do this? that, I want to, um, I'm, I'm going to ask Quincy, because you don't want me running with this microphone. You, <laughs> you may, I may tear some stuff up, but as you're talking about your kids, I'm so proud. Two of my kids are back here. So Jared, who's in the master's program at John Hopkins, teaching to teach America in D.C., and our co-candidate at history at, at um, Howard University is teaching African American history for, at Howard. So they are, I'm very, very proud. Of it. It you know, it so, so Mr. Cameron will have the first question. Good evening, uh, Dr. Perry and Dr. Lopez. My name is Jermaine Cameron from the Eagle Academy here in uh, Stapleton, Staten Island. My question is for you, uh, Dr. Perry. Earlier you mentioned that uh, when you opened the school in Bridgeport, there were 96% of your students who were unable to read or write on grade level. Could you just talk to us a little bit about the immediate moves you made uh, to ensure that you made those significant gains uh, in the second year? So one of the, we're gonna be wonky for a second, so y'all just ride with us for a second. So one of the first things that we had to do is we had to make sure that we had not just hired, but trained the, the people that we thought we had hired. Um, unfortunately, I don't think that there's a large swath of talent in terms of instruction. I don't get a lot of great teachers coming in, if I'm just being really, really honest with you. I don't know if y'all are finding that. It's just hard to find people. So one of, the, one of the mistakes that I made initially was I was thinking if I just found somebody who I thought was bright and talented, I could assign them to this task and then they would be able to take the task on and be successful in it. And I was wrong. I was like miserably, terribly, awfully wrong. So we had to go back in and we had to find curriculum from them, for them to teach. And then we, curriculum is, uh, as I define it, it's what and how you teach. It's a very big concept, it's what and how you teach. So we thought first with curriculum, that wasn't enough. Then we had to go down to lesson plans, right? We had to basically start scripting out lesson plans because it wasn't enough to tell them that these are the standards that we're teaching. We had to say, so this is how you teach the standard. And almost scripting it to the point where it's like, so now the teacher says this. And the teacher waits for a question. And then the teacher goes forward. So then, we, then what we did was we, um, we were heavy into data. Uh, and I'll tell you, the first time our state test came back, I was a mess. The, the, uh, the text that went out from my phone required apologies afterwards to my colleagues. I sent, um, yeah, so I didn't. I didn't respond really well to it. And, and we had made some bad hires. Uh, we brought some people in who, teaching is a skill that can be taught, but it's awesome if you already have some of the foundational elements of a teacher. And a teacher takes a concept, let's say bouncing a basketball, and they're able to break it down into the elements that are required to bouncing a basketball. And then they can take those elements and push them back and, and they put them in an, they organize those thoughts in such a way. And we have not been amazing at finding people who can teach people how to bounce a basketball. That's just the truth. So we started to make some other pretty uh, uh, drastic decisions. In math, um, we just pooped the bed on math. Like it was just like, wow, that was really bad. So we put together two math classes. So we, naming matters. Dr. Lopez talked earlier about branding. So we internally branding, we called it advanced math. So you had two math classes. You had a, a, your math class and you had advanced math. Advanced math, we took computerized adaptive software because I was realizing that it <laughs> it was getting to the point where, and I'm just being real with you because I don't want to sit here and give you some, some, some pie in the sky story. Like, this is real. So what happened was we kept hiring, we hired people and they just, would, my grandma said, terrible. Like, they, just, <laughs> they just couldn't teach a fish to swim. So what I had to do was that they at least could keep kids positions such that if I put them in front of the computer and the kids had the adaptive software and they could go through and it would, 
So the, as you may or may not know, as some of you as ed students, and if you are, that there's adaptive software where if you're learning how to count, it'll, it'll move with you as you do that. So that's what we did that. Um, and we just kept going and kept going. And there were a lot, as an administrator, there were some really hard conversations I had with my colleagues about getting it done. And, and, and a number of them would say, but you don't understand. I get it. I don't understand. I, I'm, I'm thick in the head. I don't get it. I don't know why we have to be performing at this level. Now, our, ours was, so you should know that the state, what they do is they set a growth trajectory, meaning they tell you about, they, they set where the kids are supposed to be. There's an objective score and then there's a growth score. The objective score is 99% of your kids, 100% of your kids can read, write, and do math on grade level. The other one is what percentage of your kids met the growth based upon what that they're supposed to be able to grow in a, in a given year. So that's, that's the, what we got. We got the growth. We still have a lot of our kids who can't read, write, and do math at grade level. It's a really, it's a really sucky thing, but, we, but in terms of the overall growth, we were able to get the highest growth because of those things. And we stayed on it and stayed on it. And here's the last part. Details matter. We work hard on school culture, really hard on school culture. We have a uniform. It's our uniform. It's non-negotiable. I have to have a conversation with the state of New York, which is awesome, because a parent called and complained about us in our uniforms, <coughs> the school that she chose. Parents think that they can remix your uniform, right? You tell them it's khaki pants. They're like, but well, why they got to be khaki pants? Because, damn it, you picked a school with khaki pants. Like, why do we got to have this conversation? It's a stupid-ass conversation. Like, seriously, why am I having this conversation with a grown person? Like, what don't you? You picked the school with the khaki pants. Well, why, they, why can't it be black sneakers? Black sneakers are a little like black shoes. Are we really having this conversation? Your son can't read. Like, stop, please. Like, you're fighting the wrong fight here. We don't back down from that fight. So I'm gonna have this conversation with the state and some bureaucrats gonna say to me, you know, Dr. Perry, you can't tell the kid they can't come to school if they don't wear a uniform. Okay, I'm gonna tell them they also come to school naked too. Like, what? there's gotta be a point where the rules matter. The rules have to matter. And, and, and we have to hold fast to that. So those are stuff that we do with the, with the, from an academic perspective. But as a school, you gotta let people know it is what it is. Like, this is what it is. If I say that you have Saturday Academy, you have Saturday Academy, you just do, man. And I do what I can to work it out. I can explain it to you, Ma. I can tell you why it is. You don't understand. Here, here's your son's score. Your son is reading at a second grade level. Let me explain to you what second grade level is, ma'am. That means that he could not read Cat in a Hat and tell me what it's about. And he's 14. So I need you to stop. So we do what we can to work with families, but to your point, we have the same meetings. My wife, um, at this point, much to her chagrin, she's responsible for our school newsletters, and she does it for all the schools, which don't mention this to her, because she's every weekend I get to hear her complain about it now. Totally shouldn't have volunteered for it. So we would get an open rate. She spends three, four, five hours on it. We get an open rate of 15%. We're emailing it to your phone. Like, seriously. Like, I literally, we emailed... The child, like we're telling you all the stuff that you say you don't know, we're emailing it to your phone. And you just can't, it's like, Dame Capital Prep, delete. It really, awesome. But tis the season, right, where they all come in. I didn't even know my child was failing. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent that, we, I mean, in terms of specifically, we had to teach, we had to coach up the teachers that we had, right, because you gotta learn, learn to win with average. That's what we're doing. We had to diminish the impact that, that people who are below average have because you can't fire your way to success, right? We, we bought adaptive software to, to change that. We, put, we make sure we push hard on, on culture. And then where we can, we, the rules have to matter. The rules really have to matter. If you have a, if you have a shirt that people have to wear, it is what it is. Can, can I ask a follow-up? More so to um, uh, Dr. Lopez, and certainly Dr. Perry, you can chime in. Um, so, undoubtedly, uh, the demographics of uh, Brownsville, very similar to that of Stapleton. Um, and on the flip side of that, I'm dealing with 100% of my population being young men of color. And so can you just speak to some of the moves that, uh, that you've made over the years since opening the school in a similar way that I did to ensure that you're meeting the needs 
of the most underserved of the underserved, <coughs> meaning our young men of color. When we began the school, we um, started with gender initiatives. So our young men is I matter. But when we started it, it was my brother's keeper. Um, and that was in 2010. And it wasn't successful. Like we would get, we would have workshops and we would, I have like a Rolodex of friends. I'm just gonna call people that I know. Or when I meet people, I just say to them, hey, I do this awesome, amazing thing, which is I lead kids and I need you to help me lead them too. Um, but what I found was my brother's keeper, while it had great intentions, people were fearful of the connotation. How long you want me to keep them for? What, what's my commitment? And I was just like, I just need two hours. Whereas she is me was for our, our, our young women. Renee could tell you hundreds. Hundreds would come. But for the boys, 20, 30. So the boys started coming to she is me. And I had to kick them out because I was like, this is not about you. So it wasn't until my third year, um, but probably the fourth year after um, the George Zimmerman case, that was the first blow, right? Like, he's acquitted. A one-year-old around the corner, Antique Hennis, was shot and killed because his dad was in gangs and they meant to have the bullet shoot the father, but it ended up killing him. And then we had like this constant profiling that was happening in the community that was just uncomfortable for our young men. So my question was, how do they know that they even matter? How do they know that they matter outside of just making it home and someone saying, oh, you're here? Who tells them that they're, they're loved and they're amazing and they'll achieve anything that they want? So I asked myself that like three times and I was sitting with my team and I said, you know what, we're gonna call it I Matter. And they were like, what? I was like, it's no more I, my brother's keeper because I realized there are not enough men in our community that understand what it means to keep. Mm -hmm. And I'm expecting them to do something that they're not capable or haven't been shown to do. But if I change it and I start to say to the young men as well as the men in the community that they have value in this world and it's self-affirming and we build this community in which we bring in individuals throughout from wherever to come talk and pour into them, it will make a difference. So that was the first thing I did. All of a sudden there were hundreds of kids showing up. The second thing I did was I created a cohort. I made every principal who had an eighth grade sign up so that it wasn't just about my hall. Because we have 32 gangs, guess what happens? These young men who were friends, who were best friends when they were growing up, up until fifth or sixth grade, now have to choose a side. So we intentionally partnered with universities throughout Brooklyn, had our scholars meet up, and we would have panels. We have five of them a year. The first one is always around social justice, because unfortunately, after the summertime, there's always a shooting, a killing that involves a young man, a young man of color. I need my kids to understand that just because this has happened in society, that they can't stop advocating. And how do we hold men who are in elected positions accountable for what's going on? And why haven't you quit? So that was the first one that we did. So we do that either at Borough Hall or at a university. The second one is around health and wellness. We're always telling our girls to protect themselves. We're always telling our girls to make sure that they don't get pregnant. But our boys are out there doing more things than our girls. And so we're not having that real conversation. We're also not talking to our young people about mental health. So we do that, we do entrepreneurship, we do behind the athlete, because we discussed earlier how many of our young men think that they're gonna be athletes. And I'm like, y'all not all gonna make it to the NBA. Especially if you're not willing to wake up at five in the morning and run up and down the stairs. So I need them to meet the people who are behind the athletes. I need them to meet the person who's going to deal with PR, the, the vice president of a company, the agent, the stock ambassador. Do you know Nike has a stock ambassador? I need them to meet those people, and they show up. And my young men have voice in the school. It's not just about sports. Every single Saturday, we have the Brooklyn Combine who comes in and they mentor our young men. They teach them coding. They have conversations. They, they are lawyers who are dealing with real life civil rights issues. They bring their court cases in. Our young men have to dissect it, ask questions. 
And the most important thing for me is that I remind them that they are kings every single day. Words are powerful and they're affirming. And a lot of our young black men come in angry and it's because they're not heard, it's because they wanna make money and can't make money, it's because their mama is not home, their daddies are incarcerated. And so I recognize all of that. And my door is always open. So it's not one day, not one period that you might see one of my young men in there. But I'm always reminding them, as long as you're in my office, you're not learning. And if you're not learning, then you're going to add to the school to prison pipeline. So I need you to get back into that room. And I don't suspend all of my kids unless it is a safety issue. If you create a safety issue, it's a non-negotiable. But because you turned up a little bit, you're not going to be suspended. But you're going to be here with me at lunchtime. <laughs> and we're going to read a book together. Or I'm going to show up at your house, which I have no problems doing either. So it's hard as a, as a black woman to do this work, especially with our young black men, because I think it's so important for black men to be in the mix. But I remind my young black men, what you don't see, I need you to become. You have to become it. I think um, something, I, I'm, I'm going to break the news here. Uh, men, especially young men, are the more sensitive ones I see of the two genders. The, the truth, right? Y'all don't think that men are more sensitive? Break one of these dudes' hearts. He will fall apart. And it's that sensitivity that makes their moms really dope over them, especially single moms that go really, really hard because they see and they're so concerned about their well-being. And, and so what we have to do is we have to hire people who understand that our boys and men, as they become, are sensitive people. And we need to arm them with the skills to speak through that sensitivity. Sadly, within our community, we have some really bizarre relationships with sexuality. And so when you start talking about a black male or a Latino male or male in general is sensitive, then people start having issues around sexuality. And it's just stupid. Like, we got to get past that. Like, just because somebody's gay, that they're more sensitive. They may be least sensitive. Like, stop being stupid. Like, for real. We got we to gotta get past that. We got to get past that silly conversation so that men and little boys can start to truly express themselves. We had three incidents in two days of boys saying that they were going to get a gun and kill somebody. This week. This is the worst week in American history to say that mess. Like, in America, like this week is the worst week. I got police everywhere who want to take people away behind that mess. But that's because so often we don't train our boys to communicate effectively through their emotions. It's, it's, and it doesn't stop when they get to college. Listen, I don't know how many times I've been in college and some girl says, I want an intelligent hoodlum. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> what did you just say? I mean, like, and, and, and we're talking about colleges, right? We're talking about college-educated African-American Latino women. Like, I want somebody who could protect me. Maybe you shouldn't need so much damn protection. Keep your mouth shut. Like, he, man, I don't want I look like we just went out. I got clothes on. I'm not trying to get scraped up here for, for you. Stop. I just met you. You know, and, and, and we have to work with both boys and girls to understand that we have to stop pushing that negative stereotype as a sign of manhood. And, and, and that's a long conversation, not tonight, but it's, it's the kind of conversation that there is no panacea, there's no program in particular, there's nothing, it's just a constant pushing of it. I can't tell you how many times, and this happens all the time, and you work with men, young men, so you notice the boy was standing next to you, big for nothing, gigantic young man, and he's standing next to you, like, why are you standing next to me? Boy, I ain't standing next to you, you standing next to me. <laughs> okay. You just want me to touch you. I don't want you to touch me, Dr. Perry. You want me to hug you. No, I don't want you to hug me. Come here. I mean, they, our boys, they, they, they're kids. Like, they're just kids. And people are scared of them. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, they're just genuinely scared of them. Like we walking around with pit bulls. And I'm not lying, I mean, I'm using that because that's what it is. People look at our kids, our boys in particular, especially if God made them big. Oh, man. He made a kid who's minority and large. Oh, no. And so people get scared of them. They really do get scared of them. And so the kids don't know how to act with somebody who's scared of them, but to play it up. And so you get, even on college campuses, dudes talking about, well, you know I'm from, man, you took the ACT in pre-calculus. Will you shut your ass up with that? Like, stop talking like that. For real, that's not cool. You up here talking about, well, I mean, you could have been in the gang. Really? You were on the swim team last year, horse. Ain't no people in the gang was rocking a Speedo. That's not true. And just because everybody in your family is, you're not. And so we have to push them to, come on, man, don't talk like that. That's not how you really feel. So what we do, what we, and, and, and what we constantly, we, we always have to do is give our young men permission to just be kids. Laugh and be silly. Boys are a lot because they just stay silly for a long time. Like, all right, you've mastered silly. I'm going to need you to serious up for a little while. I need you to, right? Because the middle school boys are just so unorganized. You're like, this mug. Right? Like, you, you lost your head already. Like, where did I put my head? Right? Because disorganized. We have to understand that awesome, and then people don't want to have, there are some gender differences in the way in which, but one difference that there is, is, but is often misunderstood is that people are scared of our boys and they don't know how to communicate through that. And so we tell them, smash, kill, destroy, smash, kill, destroy. And they, so they think they have to do. And so one of the reasons they all think they got to play a sport is because at least that people will leave them alone if, they, if they're playing that. Now, some, and a lot of us like it, but it's not the only thing we like. like. A lot of these kids are artists, like legit, crazy, sensitive artists. So they think that the only way they could be an artist is they write rhymes about killing. Like, come on, you're missing it. But we don't give them the space to be human. We make them feel like, and, and, and in the last part, with our boys in particular, they don't even get to be kids. Circumstances are such, you know, you got somebody telling them they're the man of the house. He is 13. He ain't the man of nothing. His name is not on any lease, any damn where. You can't be the man of anybody's house if you don't sign the lease. It's just the way life goes. It's just the way certain circumstances. You, can, you are a guest. <laughs> you are dependent, but you can't be a man until you sign a lease or buying something. You're not. Our kids, unfortunately, between their home circumstances where they're told that they're a man almost as soon as they can stand up just because they can grill a cheese sandwich in, in, on a stove. So we and us, we have to create a safe space. This is the point I'm at. We have to create a safe space and let them know that it's all right for you to cry that it's all right for you to not know the answer in class. And when somebody makes fun of you, bring hellfire on that child. How dare you? Create an environment where it's safe to just be a kid who happens to be a boy, who happens to be a boy. That's the only way we're gonna get past this thing. The only way. We have time for one more question. We're going to, if you're in Dr. S's sociology class, you're gonna come down front and we have you just sign in, and then we're going to debut a film, um, a little film that um, Dr. Perry's students made last week. So one question, make it good. One more question. Thank you, Quincy. I had a question. <laughs> well, I appreciate you, Quincy. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Perry, Dr. Lopez, thank you for coming, first of all. Um, I am curious to know how you're uh, leveraging different stakeholders. As you know, the system is failing our kids right now, and school is only one part of it. So you have 14-year-olds that can hardly read, so do I. And um, I teach at a, a Kip College Prep in D.C., which we have an abundance of resources <laughs> where we still aren't doing a good enough job, right? And how do we leverage different stakeholders, stakeholders for teacher development so we don't have to have computers to teach our children, right? Or different nonprofits to get those men or women in the community around our children to be like that positive role model 
and just trying to figure out how we leverage different nonprofits, such as Teach Teach for America, or you know any other social group that is willing to do the work because I believe they're out there and we need to like streamline it somehow to get everyone involved. But just w just want to hear your suggestions on how do we <clears throat> move forward. For um, I think my greatest strength is I'm a networker. And so, you know, I just, I since a kid, I just knew how to network and broker relationships, like really build relationships. So the success of Mott Hall Bridges Academy is not that of my own, is that there are people who are committed to coming in. So whether that's personal friends, people I've met over the years, who are willing to volunteer their time to become mentors. Um, it wasn't like an outside organization that just came in. Um, anyone who works with me has worked with me and has had to show their worth to be in my space because I consider it very sacred. Um, in terms of like the kids and, and where they're at, I will say this about the team that we have. People are committed to staying beyond the school day. And it goes back to leadership. I don't leave my building until 9, 10 o'clock at night. Sometimes I'm leaving at midnight with the custodians. Anyone who will call the building, they'll sit, literally sit there like jokingly, my parents will be like, Christopher Lopez, I knew you was gonna be there because I'm always there. So when you set the tone that you leave at 2.45, guess what time your staff is gonna leave at 2.45? You're already saying anything else is not important. These children learning beyond three o'clock is not important. So I don't take an extra dime to stay with my kids. If my teachers can't stay, I'll stay. I'll run classes. I'll do whatever it takes. And when my staff sees that, they're willing to do the extra work. So it comes with the belief system that comes with the buy-in where people are committed. So it's who's on the team. And you don't need 100 people to be on that team. Five good people that you find that are committed, who are willing to sit and support these, you know, whoever those scholars are, is good enough. Finding your own personal friends, make it a weekend. Make it a week. I get people every single month to come to the school that are just my friends. If they can't come this month, oh, I got something else for you next month. Don't worry, we got events happening at my hall. And they're willing to show up because at the end of the day, one, I'm not ex overextending their time. They know that what they're putting in, they're gonna get out of a scholar. To see them graduate and walk across the stage is the biggest thing that anyone can ever desire for children. Um, but leadership always matters. And you don't need a title for leadership. Because the same things I'm doing as a principal, I did as a teacher. I stayed long hours, I was committed to the process because I just wanted my kids, like Dr. Perry said, to win. And if they're not winning, then I'm not winning either. So mine is a, is, a, is a shorter answer because I'm really bad at networking. Like if, if I were just here and I wasn't up here, I would sit down and I probably wouldn't speak to anybody. Y'all would think, wow, what's wrong with that guy? It's not because I'm shy, I just, it's not something I, I, I do well. Um, you know, I grew up in, in the space that I grew up in, I was always told don't ask anybody for anything. So I always felt badly asking for things. Like I really do. It's, it's, it's something that I have spent a considerable amount of time as, a, as an adult working on, just working on me. To, to, and the only way I can get myself to do it in any way, shape, or form is to just think, you're asking for the kids, you're asking for the kids. I, I have to get myself, I, I'm, I'm just being real with you because I want you to understand, like just because I'm here in this, I, I, that's something that I don't do well. I do not, I do not. Um, and, and it's tough for me, uh, so it takes a lot. Um, and I have had a number of experiences where I've depended upon people and have not come through, and I've been sitting there with children and they've not come through. Um, so I've struggled with that, if, again, in all transparency. I know that that's the right answer, what she said, that is the right answer, what she's saying, that is the absolute right answer. It's something I have to continue to work on in my leadership and acknowledge that I'm bad at it, Right, not like I'm proud that I'm bad at it. Like I don't like being bad at things that I, I should be good at. But I have to put people on my team who are good at it. Um, I don't even have business cards. 
Like, I really don't. And I'm always in the play, like, I was supposed to have those. And someone has said to me, like, they printed them up, and they put them in my bag, and they put the bag in my car. And they're like, keep the business cards on you. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I got you. And I don't have them. So mine is a difficult situation. So I, I'm just being real with you that it, it, that's the right answer. You got to get out there. You got to do it. You have to. You have to. So to the best of my ability, what I do is I, I put it out there to people who I believe believe what I believe. And, and, I, and I try to work with them. I, I, there are a lot of y'all who I see, and I'm just being, again, real. Just by the way you've stayed through this conversation and the way you've leaned in, there are a lot of you I would love to work with. Straight up. That's just an honest, I, I get a sense. And, and you, you, you can't win forever on, a, on sense. You got to put a system in place. I know that. But right now, it's helping me. Like, that's what I do well. So I got to lean into what I do well. So I, when I'm out in the community, I, I am always looking for people. But I say this, final piece. People often want to come in and talk to my kids. I don't really want anybody else to talk to my kids. Like, my kids get that. Like, can I come talk to your kids? About what? Going to college. I already told them. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, if you want to build with them, right, then let's talk about building with them. I want to tell them my story. It's not really that interesting. <laughs> I've heard it. And for an eighth grader, it's really not interesting. <laughs> So for me, what I, I try to do, is, as she said, is I try to get some sort of quantity, I mean quality together. People who are willing to ride for my kids. And if they're gonna do that, then I'll do whatever I can, but I see it as an exchange, the final part. I see it as an exchange, right? So if I find out there's something that you need and that I need, then we work together. So then I, then I can overcome my own issues, right? I got issues, right? I can overcome my own issues of one, I'm not asking you for anything, so I don't owe you nothing. Right, true story. This is what I grow up a certain way. It, it takes it takes a long time to get rid of this thing. It really does. Uh, if y'all thought you were just gonna lose it just because you got a degree, I got a couple of them. It, it doesn't go that easily. So that's true, right? So now I'm not asking you for anything, and then we both get something out of it. So at no point are you like, man, I did do the heat. Uh, I don't hear that. You leave. So it's got to be something that's mutually beneficial. And then when it's mutually beneficial, I have to put it together, as, as she said, in a way that's consistent with what your time and resources are. So I should never, if you only have an hour a week, I gotta ask you for 30 minutes. I wanna use all 60. I'll, so you got 60, can I take 30? Just 30, once a week. I mean, once a month, whatever that might be. So does that make sense? I hope that didn't sound too bizarre and esoteric, but that's, maybe I was, yeah. yeah. Dean Wright, before, thank you. Yeah. Very much, Dr. Perry, Dr. Lopez. Before we show the video, I'd like to ask Dr. Lopez to say a few words because she's got to get on that yes, plane. I got a plane to catch, folks. Yes. Um, and it's raining. So um, I keep staring at this paper. And um, first and foremost, I, I just want to thank the Wagner community, the deputy borough president. <laughs> bottom of this of this flyer the program it says be brave be bold be kind be just be loved and I'm gonna ask that when you take this home you look at it and you think about what that means to you when I came to Wagner I came here as a child of immigrants my grandmother died right before her 90th birthday she never went to school. My parents never graduated formal education. They, they never got a degree. All they could do is hope and aspire that I'd become something. Mm -hmm. Me coming to Wagner meant that their hope for me, and my name being Nadia, was my mother's way of reminding herself of hope, because that's what the name means. My mother had five miscarriages before me, and then after me, she had one. I am her hope. I came to Wagner. I went through the nursing program. I worked hard. I worked hard. I don't know what the caves look like. I don't know what anything on this beyond Wagner College. 
and the library looks like because all I knew what to do was do well in school because my parents were spending good money for me to be here. Specifically my mother because her and my dad had split up. So my mother who was a nurse's assistant wanted me to be a nurse because she wanted me to be better than her. My mother is the best. And what she did by being a nurse assistant is what she was capable of being because she didn't have a formal education. So she pushed me and pushed me and pushed me. And although at the end I decided this is not my calling, I took everything that I learned here at Wagner College from every professor, the great ones and some of the worst ones. <laughs> but what they taught me was you have to be compassionate about your work. You all have a story, and I don't know what that is, but you come here with this mindset that something you're going to do is going to be with passion. And within your four years here, you may change your mind. Because I went from nursing to telecommunications to opening up a school. I found my purpose. To have a day dedicated to now call my mom and tell her that, I could just imagine the tears of joy. Not only for her, but my 16-year-old daughter, who sacrifices her mother every single day to be with other people's children. She is the most selfless little girl on this earth. So if you decide after you graduate you're going to change your mind, it's OK. If you decide you want to go into education, if you decide you want to serve others, great. If you decide, I don't know what I want to do yet, fine. But be brave, be bold, be kind, be just, and be loved. That's all I can offer you. And I hope that one day you come back to Wagner, you get to sit here, you get to impart something inspiring to the next generation. Because this means nothing if you're not going to pour back into the next community of people who can be change agents. Class is in session. They say we know how to because we can. Lies. If we really know how to, then why is there a achievement gap between blacks and whites and my people are the ones left behind? Oh yes, because we're called Unteachable. And our zip codes Define our future Only 57% of children from Compton, California graduate from public high school 66% of Bridgeport, Connecticut But 98% of Scarsdale, New York And 100% of Beverly Hills, California Is this because our public schools are failing? Yes And our community is dominantly black? Of course America, you may still try to keep us behind And put the shackles around our hands But your objective will never be reached Dear America Who are we as the people? Our school funding's decreasing, so how in the world are we equal? What do you see? Just outside of me? My skin should define who I am, and our skin should define how much money we get for our school. We are just trying to get knowledge, but now I really see. Knowledge is power, so we can't have, nor can we be. But as Juppel said, we are all black without our apology. And when President Barack Obama got elected, it shows that we can. But now we got this white man as our 45th employee, showing us that even if we could, we still can't. But this is our time to come together and join hands. We are the people. Dear America. Why do we look like an abomination to you? You say that this is a free country, but every time you get a chance, you see us as professional junkies. Is it you or is it me? Is it me or is it you? Can you answer that? I bet you can't. Just like how you take away every grant. America, what exactly are you trying to do? Is it 1787 or are you falling deeper into oppression? Deeper into oppression or into aggression? Deeper into aggression or into depression? Figure it out. Dear America! You say you are of the people, by the people, and for the people, in which you have implemented into our nation's creed, and it's what you say you bleed? Then why is it that our black population is being deceived? Deceived by the 13th Amendment, 
deceived by the First Amendment, deceived by the education system that states that we have an equal education, when in a school predominantly black, teachers don't have the dedication to give kids like me a proper education. Dear America, how can you say that our nation is free when whites and blacks, they still don't agree? Can't you see who you made us out to be? A place where there is no peace, a place where police brutality increases, a place where a child's dream subsides. Can't you see why our so-called great nation cannot rise? A place where there is no hope and every black child, including me, is expected to grow up and sell dope. A place where a black person is expected to be on crack cocaine so that our prison systems can earn an extra dollar to their name. Dear America, it's time for a change, and it's something about you that obviously needs to be arranged. Dear America! Why so unfair? We don't learn any of this. The only things we learn is how to speak to different colored people than us because they're going to think we're a ghetto. People different than us get these huge force facilities, which is four times bigger than the building we have, to learn to get A's and B's so we can give our generation's future something to look back at and make it feel proud of being who they are. We learn to do whatever a cop says because we know in a blink of an eye you can have a dark hole as deep as your past in your head. I can't take it anymore. My Latinos and African American friends have to see somebody speak up for them. You know the side didn't call Latinos immigrants or Mexicans? It's because I understand that the same way some people don't like to be called pigs or twelves, my people don't like being called names either. I'm the speaker for my generation and I won't be stopping until equality is reached. Yeah, America! With an increasing amount of issues in our country, our leaders' ignorance is choosing our destiny. Our people complain of their dire situations, but our leaders have stopped working to improve our great nation. We have complained of our president-elect, of how he'll start a war leaving us in regret. In order to get back on the equality tracks, we must lace up our shoes and get off our backs. We are angered by discrimination, disrespect, and poverty, but our leaders have not done much to get rid of it honestly. Our leaders must know the positions for you stand, for a nation united is how we'll expand. Dr. King had his dream, and he worked to make it real, but we're still complaining. So dear America, what's the deal? Until we come together as a united country, a divided group of people is all we'll ever be. I'm black. So? I'll never be successful. We know. I'll be seen by my color and not by my character. Obviously. But is that acceptable? No. We are the statistics. We're three times more likely to be killed by people of the opposite color. And it seems like 99% of those have not been held accountable. As the facets of slavery are being portrayed in this society and more innocent souls are bending into pavements, we're told to stop faking. Unfortunately, taking knees, raising clenched fists, and saying Black Lives Matter isn't good enough. Or is it that you don't care? Generation after generation, we're told lies. We're defined by every single statistic as if we belong seated in the dirt. Well, do we? We are minorities attending a school with a statistic of 100% graduates. Aren't you, please? Or will you try your hardest to take that away from us? Dear America! Here lies a melting pot full of injustice issues and inequality. Dear America! Here is every minority rising higher than your expectations. Dear America! Our generation is taking over. Class is missed!